Thanks everyone for coming today. I have a great pleasure of talking about a group of objects of which we have one specimen on loan in the museum in our identity exhibition, Identity in the Ancient World, um, where uh, I felt that a specimen of one of these funerary portraits from Roman Egypt would add to the story about uh, identity, cultural identity, ethnic identity, and many other forms. And uh, so I thought it'd be a good opportunity to talk about that object and that whole group of object. Uh, so that is the topic of my talk today. And um, you know, to give you a bit of background, these portraits, um, many of them painted on wood, some of them on linen, um, are part of a millennia old tradition in Egypt of mummification. Um, these portraits, to our eyes at least, uh, look very naturalistic, but questions for scholars are, are they also realistic or are they idealized, are they beautified in some way? Um, today, the excuse, the reason for our talk is the portrait of this young man, um, and that allows me to talk about a subject that I've been talking about before here at the museum, cultural uh, uh, entanglements uh, and ethnic identity in relation to the exhibition that we have. Um, I will speak a little bit about archaeological contexts, particularly two sites, uh, usually called Havara and Rubaiyat. Uh, those are both two modern Arabic names, not ancient. Um, and I will use the opportunity to talk a little bit about artistic workshops. That's a subject that uh, I became interested in a few years ago. Uh, there's a whole group of scholars uh, that uh, Getty has brought together with a multi-year project uh, on these funerary portraits. And one of the questions that we all have is, can we identify workshops or the hand of an artist? Uh, and if you can, how do you do that? Uh, and I stumbled upon uh, a quote-unquote painter who's known by the name the St. Louis painter. Not because he was from St. Louis, but because one of his specimens ha has uh, found its home there. So here you see the top half uh, of a mummy coffin, and you can see how a mummy portrait, a funerary portrait, would be wrapped into the bandages. All of these portraits we can now date to the Roman Imperial period. In Egypt they have been mummifying uh, the remains of the deceased since the fourth millennium before the Common Era. So this is a, a tradition that continued for almost four and a half thousand years. Um, of these um, painted panels and painted linen shrouds there are more than a thousand that survive. Most come from the Fayum Oasis. I will show you a map in a little bit, which is why they are often also called Fayum portraits. Um, but they're also from other sites, especially the site of uh, Antinopolis, which is in the middle of Egypt. They are examples of entanglement in various ways. Religious, cultural, funerary, artistic traditions all come together in these beautiful portraits. Um, we always want to know the basic questions, uh, or rather, answers to the basic questions like, you know, who, why, when, for whom, what's the purpose, why were they made? Uh, most of the time, it's like, we don't really know. We have to speculate. Another question that we've been f facing is, they look so naturalistic, but are they lifelike? Um, are they idealizing? When you have a mummy portrait, but you do not have the physical remains of that person. You cannot even know, uh, uh, even with the advance of science today, uh, what that um, person may have looked like to compare it with the portrait that we have. Um, when I say we don't have the mummies, that's because excavators in the 19th century threw away the mummies, the, the physical remains of the dead. Um, here are a couple of uh, pieces that I uh, was fortunate enough to research when I was in the Allard Pearson Museum in Amsterdam. Uh, the middle one is just a, a slim fragment um, of an old lady. Um, we know that she is old because she has uh, grayish white hair. Um, and there is uh, uh, on the left a young girl uh, and then there is a early mature woman. 
One of the questions that we cannot answer that uh, scholars have been going back and forth about is were they painted in their lifetime because so many look so young. Um, and then the, the thought was, well, they were painted uh, when the people were um, in the, the glory of their lives and then later on they were inserted in their mummified remains. This middle sliver is already an indication, well, some of them are, you know, with gray hair, They're, they must be uh, um, elderly. Um, so some may perhaps be idealized, representing youthful beauty, but we also see mature and elderly portraits. We also have portraits of children. Um, on top of that, you have to remember that life expectancy was frightfully low, uh, really 20 years of age uh, at birth is life expectancy for a woman. Mm -hmm. This is mostly due to all sorts of diseases, but on top of that, the dangers of pregnancy. Um, there's also a high infant mortality. Uh, for men, the life expectancy is about twice as high, so 40. Still very low. Once you've survived the first five, six years of life, life expectancy gets higher though. Um, but that is what we are facing. Um, this is the reason why we're here. A beautiful portrait that we're very fortunate to have on view uh, upstairs on the second floor. If you haven't seen it with your own eyes, please do so after uh, this talk. Um, this is an example of a piece that came uh, through a private collector and we cannot trace where that private collector bought it from. Uh, it's now in the Menil collection in Houston. Uh, and therefore we can recognize that it's from Egypt, but we don't know where in Egypt. Um, stylistically, we can date it to the Roman Imperial period. The dates given here is what the uh, museum has given it as dates. The wood has been tested uh, and it confirms what uh, other scholars have found, that the panels of the, the wood is made of linden, about two-thirds, maybe even close to three-quarter, is made of linden wood. That's a kind of wood that does not grow in northern Africa. So it's an indication of import from Greece or Italy. The technique is encaustic, that means that the pigments are blended with beeswax. This piece is a bit too big to fit into the wrappings of a mummy. So even though it looks like a funerary portrait and it's in the exact same style as um, uh, as many others. Um, there's something else happening here and it's difficult to see, so we shift to this photograph. Uh, just zooming in on the top, um, you may be able to see there are two busts. Um, he's wearing something on top of his head, beautiful long hair like Zeus or Hades of the underworld. And then there's a lady here with a necklace, long hair and also something on her head. Who are they? Some people have seen this in Heraklion. These are Isis and Serapis, also Persephone and Hades. Uh, so gods with a connection to the underworld and gods with a connection both to Greece and to Egypt. Difficult to see, but it confirms that this is a funerary portrait, but this example very likely was, uh, certainly was not part of a mummified remains wrapped in bandages, uh, must have hung maybe in a um, uh, cemetery structure, um, a mausoleum or a tomb structure of some kind. So this beautiful piece has shown several types of cultural connections coming together. Mummification is an age-old tradition, uh, as I said. The painting style and caustic is Greek. The uh, style of painting compares very well to the paintings in Herculaneum and Pompeii, so it's a Roman uh, style as well. The clothing is inspired by Greek clothes, but it's not exactly how Greeks would wear their clothes. Uh, there are other for, uh, paintings where you see a more Roman-inspired clothing. The hairstyle is particularly Roman, certainly the facial hair is something that uh, uh, Emperor Hadrian reintroduced. The ethnicity, not specifically Greek, not specifically Roman, not specifically Egyptian, it's 
a blend, a Mediterranean uh, appearance. Um, then we have those two busts of gods who are Hellenized Egyptian deities, Isis associated with Persephone and Serapis associated with Hades. Um, so a beautiful example of, uh, uh, of this tradition that somehow in the Roman Imperial period was added to this long tradition of mummification. Before that, there were no naturalistic or realistic portraits uh, on uh, the mummified remains. There may have been a mask uh, or a, a think of Tutankhamun's mask, very generic, beautiful, but not with individual portrait features. So I mentioned that they, these paintings as a group are often called Fayum portraits. You see the map of Egypt here at the top, you have like a lotus flower, that's the Nile Delta. When you go down a little bit, you see a flower coming down from the stem of the River Nile. That's the Fayum oasis. In antiquity, it was what, somewhat larger than it is now. Um, but most about, um, certainly half, uh, have been excavated or found in that area. Uh, mostly two sites. One has for very long been called Rubaiyat, but if you go to the very first publication, they say it was near Rubaiyat and they walked for an hour and a half to get to the cemetery where they found them. So Rubaiyat was a, we don't know where, what the name of the cemetery is, we just say it's near Rubaiyat. How they were acquired, I'll get to in a bit, but they are associated with a dealer uh, called Theodor Graf, and exactly at the same time, uh, the famous Egyptologist, archaeologist Flinders Petrie excavated also in the Fayum at the site that he called Havara. That's an, also a modern Arabic name, uh, but that's a cemetery that belongs to a city called Kokidopolis, the city of the crocodile. Um, and then a little later, a French archaeologist excavated uh, uh, a great number of pieces in Antinopolis, which is in the middle of Egypt. One third of the entire series, so there are, like I said, around 1100, a little more maybe, uh, so over 300 have no provenance indication whatsoever. They came on the market, no one knows where they're from. And 40 are listed as being from Fayum, but not what site. So that probably is circular reasoning. They look like Fayum portraits, so this probably also came from the Fayum. Uh, this is how Petrie in 1911 uh, presented his excavations in London. You can see that there are children. Uh, you see that there are complete specimens, but you see that most of the portraits are completely disembodied put in little square frames as if they are paintings uh, and many of them actually did go to the National Gallery. Uh, they are now uh, given to the British Museum, but this is how they were presented. And he did not, re he, he sort of reported where he found what mummy and sometimes what kind of objects he found with that mummy, but most of the connection between objects and uh, the mummies were lost. He also said that they were rammed together, so it was a kind of secondary burial where probably the mummified remains from families who no longer lived there or who could no longer take care of them um, left them uh, and they were stuffed together. Uh, legs were broken, uh, bits were uh, <coughs> missing. Uh, you, the green is the Fayum as it is now. In antiquity, uh, the Fayum was a little farther to the east, um, where it says Arubiat, that is where uh, most scholars still say the portraits are from. They forget that initially they said near, that turned into at or in, um, and Philadelphia is the city uh, where there's a cemetery where we know that is actually where they were found. We now know that that city was called Philadelphia, uh, the, the city of brotherly love. Um, that's a distance of uh, 11 kilometers, seven miles. Uh, and so a couple of us scholars are trying to convince uh, the rest is like, please stop using the word Rubaiyat because that's not where they were found. 
Um, also, very shortly after they were found, uh, someone visited that cemetery and made some drawings. The mummy portraits that were found, over 300, were all disembodied from the mummified remains because <clears throat> this is what happened. A group of Bedouins were looking for salt. They were digging, found a cemetery, saw these beautiful portraits and said, we can make money, but if we bring the entire mummified remains with us, that's clumsy. We are going to get caught because we're doing something illegal. So they burned the mummified remains and only took the portraits. So we do not know if they were found with anything like pots or jewelry or anything. But from these structures, some of them uh, certainly look like secondary burial. Um, they were stuffed together um, and that larger upper ground circular structure may have been perhaps a family tomb. It looks to me that most of these here in uh, ancient Philadelphia uh, were again left. The fam there was no family to, ca to take care and so on the cemetery they decide we're going to move them into secondary burial. What that means is that the archaeological context is not the primary archaeological context in which we would hope to find them. So despite the fact that archaeologists always emphasize how important the archaeological context is, and it is, um, it also shows that sometimes it can be rather disappointing. Uh, also interesting, Theodore Graf interpreted these portraits as representing the kings and queens and their children from the Ptolemaic period who did not live in the Fayum oasis. Um, and he took his uh, hundreds of portraits through Europe uh, and the US uh, to try and sell them, uh, and most of them uh, did. My colleagues have been trying to group paintings together that uh, they see you know, features, similar kinds of styles. Uh, the one at the bottom, uh, my friend uh, uh, Maria Svoboda calls it the buck teeth group because strange lips that look like buck teeth. Um, and uh, the, other one, the other group, she also uh, is the first one to uh, group them together or at least to make this presentation. You can see how much they look like each other. There's one painting in the Brooklyn uh, collection and so they ended up calling it the Brooklyn Painter. The thing is that both these groups are from Rubaya, so from the cemetery of ancient Philadelphia. So then the question is, is then this from the same workshop or is it representing different generations? Um, and this is to illustrate that pieces are still being excavated at the site. Uh, this piece is painted on linen that was covered with gesso and then painted over. Uh, so quite recently uh, the Egyptian mission recognized that they needed to start excavating this cemetery all over again. Uh, and they were surprised that they were still able to find another mummy portrait that clearly belongs to the Brooklyn Painter workshop. Exactly same posture, same attributes. It's just painted on linen rather than on wood. This is the archaeological context. Not a tomb, not a grave. Um, uh, I don't even think that this is secondary burial. Uh, this is probably the leftovers from the looting. Maybe those Bedouins in the, the 1880s. When I was working on that fragment in, Ale uh, in the Aller Pearson Museum and noticed that uh, it reflects an old woman. I thought, hmm, that's rare. How many old women are there? And, a lot. and then <laughs> in the corpus of the Fayum portraits. And then I, came, I stumbled upon a whole group that were clearly by the same painter who didn't only paint elderly women, but very significant number of portraits of older women also men. 
Um, this painter has been called the St. Louis painter by Paul Thompson in uh, 1982, who was doing research on uh, mummy portraits at the Getty and recognized the first three uh, at the uh, top left as being by the same painter. He, and then he said something like, there are others that belong to the same group in uh, directly or indirectly, but never gave a number. Uh, this portrait at the top, the Würzburg uh, portrait, um, has also been uh, the name piece for supposedly another painter called the Würzburg painter. Clearly, these are uh, by the same artist. Um, but there are scholars who keep them separate, and there are scholars who realize that they, uh, that they must be by the same artist. At the moment, I have attributed 25 pieces, but I think there are at least 10 more. The main publication where most known uh, pieces have been published, they're in black and white. Sometimes the, the photo is rather vague, so I would have to sit down uh, and go through it page by page uh, to um, go through that list because that particular author also didn't recognize that some of the, I mean, recognize some of them being by the same painter, but not all of them. So this is the, the painting after which the, the workshop is named, the St. Louis painter, because this is at the St. Louis Art Museum, uh, listed as being from Rubaiyat, that is ancient Philadelphia in the Fayum. It came from the Theodore Graf collection. Um, so we have a, a confirmation through that. All or at least most of the paintings that Theodore Graf sold uh, must come from Philadelphia. Um, here, interestingly, the wood is willow, where we're not entirely sure if that was native in Egypt either. Um, the pigments have been uh, examined uh, and you come uh, to the conclusion that apart from black and white, there are only three colors, not encaustic. This is what we call tempera, but not with egg yolk, um, but with some glue, organic glue, probably an animal glue um, that hasn't been identified yet. Uh, this is the example that um, has led some uh, scholars uh, to not realize they are from the same uh, group. The Würzburg painter, also from the Theodore Graf, also from quote unquote Rubaiyat, uh, has not been uh, examined scientifically, so we don't know the wood type uh, or what kind of pigments exactly were used. But you can see that the color scheme is quite similar. There were pieces where I was wondering are these by the same artist? I was skeptical about the piece that was uh, at Christie's. Um, I think the face was restored, so that makes it difficult to uh, identify. Um, the one from RISD has so many crazy things happening in the back that I um, was hesitant. And then uh, the young boy uh, that was at Sotheby's in 2000, 2009, I'm not quite sure of either, but he may be, and he's back on the market. So get your wallet uh, and buy it next week. Um, is this like a generation later by a pupil of, this, of the painter that we've been studying? And then in the same sale, there is a piece that I've never seen before. Look at the necklace. Look at her necklace on the left. Look at this necklace. Same earrings, same earrings. Uh, a bit more attention is paid to the tunic, but so there are still pieces out there. Um, so it wouldn't surprise me if the total um, number of paintings comes to maybe 35, 36. Um, I tried, this is very subjective, uh, to create an indication of age distribution. Um, and you see some striking uh, differences between uh, the men and the women. Um, there are more young men than there are young women. You would expect there to be a lot of young women because of you know, the very low life expectancy. Uh, and then 
the opposite also happens. There are more elderly women than there are elderly men. No children at all. Maybe accident. It may also be that um, you have to imagine that these portraits are expensive. Mummification itself is expensive. This is something only for the rich uh, and maybe they forego uh, creating a funerary portrait uh, for, for their babies. So when you start thinking about how do we attribute a workshop or an artist, uh, you start looking for patterns. Um, once I started drawing this, uh, I couldn't even recognize which one was which, apart from the hairstyle, they are identical. The same um, basic outline for the face, the same uh, neckline where the tunic uh, uh, or the hem of the tunic uh, is, the neck is always drawn in the same way, the posture is always the same, uh, there's always this disconnect between the left and right shoulder. Um, the men are slightly more frontal, um, but there's very little sense of perspective. There's some sense of volume. There's usually foreshortening. Um, the outlines are always painted in a, uh, in a broad brush stroke, and then the details are added with a finer brush stroke, which leads to questions like, were the outlines painted first, like a uh, kind of assembly line, and then you have them sit there until someone walks in, and then you add the details. Um, also uh, brings up questions like, was the apprentice doing the outlines and the master doing the detail? Questions, no answers. Um, the technique is very expressive. Look at all these big eyes. The lines are always hatched. They're both parallel and crisscross hatches. Um, the folds in the neck, are those wrinkles or are they trying to indicate that the person's head is turned? Um, the anatomy is unnatural. The eyes are usually much larger than normal. Um, there's also something that Paul Thompson identified as being uh, an idiosyncrasy for this painter that the nostril openings are painted with a blob and the nostrils were not painted very uh, accurately. Uh, there are some an anatomical awkwardness, but other paintings have perfect noses. Did he learn? Oh, by the way, why do I say he? We don't know. Could be a she. Um, the tunics, whether for men or, or women, are identical doesn't matter. The color scheme too. Uh, uh, for women there are colors, for men there is generally just a white tunic. There's some variation in the stripes uh, on the tunic, um, but it, once you start looking for the commonalities, you almost get lost in how similar they are. Um, we also wanted to look at proportions. We see that they are natural. When you first look at them, you think, oh, they're so lifelike, they're so naturalistic, must be realistic portraiture. And then you look at how big the eyes are, how elongated the faces are. So um, a colleague of mine at uh, the Ashmolean, Jeff and Thistlewood, uh, drew these concentric circles with lines uh, in a 10 by 10 grid um, and found that that kind of grit fits over all the portraits that he examined. Um, I couldn't really make it work. I came up with a grid of 10 by 12 that accounts for the elliptic shape of the head and it also accounts for the foreshortening on usually one side. Even when the male portrait is looking straight at you, there's still some sense of um, uh, foreshortening. Um, once you compare this grid with the average human grid, you, real, you realize these proportions are not natural either. So where are these proportions coming from? Uh, Egyptologists would like to demonstrate that they are based on Egyptian canon of proportions. Unfortunately, scholars have been unable even in 
sculpture but also in two-dimensional representations to figure out what kind of grid Egyptians used. This is an example of a grid, but we would think you use the mouth, the nose, the eyes. Well, this grid certainly doesn't do any of that. Um, halfway under the chin. So this is uh, interesting, but not helpful for what we were hoping for. Uh, then we have uh, another, um, also not 4 by 4 like this, but 4 by 5 And this is exceptional because it's a frontal sketch. Um, also, not what we find in the funerary portraits from Rome in Egypt. So, I looked somewhere else. And in Pompeii, we find these two beautiful portraits that have the exact same grid and that actually also look very much like the funerary portraits that we are examining. Um, so, as I hinted at in the beginning, the style is Greco-Roman in painting, uh, Greek in technique, more Roman even in style. Um, and uh, I can also add, it does not follow the proportions that Vitruvius had said port Roman portrait painters needed to follow. So back to, um, to this group. When you want to date portraits, uh, one thing that is helpful is that the Roman imperial court changed their ha hairstyle with each generation. And so the hairstyles might help. Then you look at these hairstyles and you see that they don't change much, but they're also rather generic. Um, I pointed out that some have the same jewelry. Um, the earrings, uh, I'll show you later, are almost identical if there are earrings. Um, the tunics are almost identical. There is some variation in color for women. For men there isn't. All white. Only the Würzburg painter has a mantle um, that changes uh, his outlook and it's mostly gone but the mantle is uh, fastened with a brooch. Uh, brooch. Uh, the facial hairstyle is something that um, in the early Roman imperial period uh, men would probably not be uh, depicted with a beard. Um, under the Emperor Hadrian in the late first century uh, the beard was reintroduced. So that might be giving us one clue. Uh, the hairstyle of the man, little variation. You can see that they also depict balding, so not an attempt at idealizing, I would say. These are the earrings. Yeah, if you look closely, then they're all slightly different, but I think the similarity is more striking than the differences. That there are differences still means that the painter is having fun. There's a system in the way it is painted, but still there are some little differences. Um, but there are 10 in the catalog that I have uh, examined. The one that I showed that's on the market at Christie's right now has the same earrings also. Um, three pearls in a double loop. That is a very common piece of jewelry. So you, you can't use that for a dating criterion either. Um, there are only two examples that have, no, have none. Then there's the beautiful necklace uh, that I think now four um, have. Um, I think that's a little later. So sliding certainly in the second century, but that's um, yeah, for now. And one has a what looks like a headband and a very bad hair day. Um, for men, tunic always white, um, the stripes usually a shade of grey, uh, the mantle uh, of the Würzburg portrait in beautiful ochre, um, and um, there's usually a mantle sh thrown over the shoulder. So there are two kinds of mantles, one we call himation and the other klamis, 
Both are Greek words, no idea if that's what they called him in uh, Roman Egypt. Um, but the, the, the cloak that the, the middle, uh, the Würzburg painter portrait wears, seems to refer back to the Macedonian tradition. Um, then there's the brooch, uh, brooch, the wreath on the wristy piece, uh, and I have no idea what happens behind him. So when we think about artistic practices, um, unfortunately we, we know very little about it, but there's a, this beautiful example uh, that is uh, also found in the Fayum in Teptunis, that's on the other side and northwestern uh, part of the oasis, um, that has some written text around a sketch on the back uh, of the painting. And maybe that gives us some clue because either that is something that the artist is writing to himself or herself, or that is a, um, uh, a hint to a pupil. So some of these instructions have to be in interpreted because it would say uh, that the hair needs to be, uh, <laughs> the skin needs to be wheat colored. Does that mean fair? Um, and the, the eyes need to be uh, more pleasant. Um, but at least we have here some kind of process happening. There's a sketch, there is some text written on it. Um, but that is about as far as we get. Who is this person writing to? Is that just a note to the self or is this to a pupil? Um, uh, why wouldn't there be pupils? Um, we look at panel shapes and scholars were hoping that panel shapes could help us identify where they were made, maybe the workshop or the cemetery where they were found. Um, then it turns out that in our schemas uh, they don't fit the panels that we find because they can take any shape they want uh, and from the panel shapes of our group, you can see they do anything. It's just a matter of making it fit uh, in the, uh, the mummy wrappings. Um, Petri uh, in Hawara did find this, cups of pigments. Uh, so that gives us at least an, uh, an impression of what kind of colors would be accessible to a painter. Um, doesn't mean that that particular painter was a painter of uh, portraits, but we also don't know if someone who made funerary portraits also made paintings of other things, painted frescoes or uh, had, you know, just a very specific job of only making funerary works. There is very little comparative material um, and this is one. Um, this represents uh, the family of Emperor Septimius Severus um, with uh, <laughs> Geta erased because he was appointed as co-ruler with his brother, but Caracalla had a different idea about that. Um, this is also painted on wood um, uh, and so this is clearly not a funerary portrait, um, but an imperial portrait. Does it look like the style of our painter? Maybe a little bit. Scholars have been giving dates between 165 through 350 of this group of paintings that we are examining. So that cannot be of one painter, even for one painter's workshop existing over generations. There must be something wrong in the dating that uh, scholars have used. Um, one of the publications that has spent most time redating the portraits did not realize that these 25 paintings are by the same workshop, if not by the same artist. Um, did not recognize that the Würzburg painter and the St. Louis painter must be the same person or at least the same workshop. So there's a lot that needs to be done. For me, this, is, uh, uh, this has been just the start. Um, like I said, I've worked on 25 portraits, but I'm sure there are more, maybe 10, maybe even more. 
uh, they have this very expressionistic technique, um, which at the same time is very simplified in outline. Uh, the only differences that you find uh, are in the, um, in the coiffure. The tunics are the same. There's just very basic jewelry. And then the master comes with the fine brush stroke to add the, uh, the portrait features. And that's the, where, where the real different lies. Um, the material is really very basic. They are all tempera, but we don't exactly know what kind of organic um, binder that is. Probably animal glue made from, uh, from bones, but that's a speculation. Um, but usually, apart from black and white, uh, carbon and, and gypsum, three or four pigments for the colors. Uh, the dating is uncertain. Uh, I go by second, third century, um, but there are scholars who date this, some paintings of this group way into the fourth century. So um, we have this beautiful corpus, this group of over a thousand paintings. Um, these are the earliest repre surviving representations of humans, of portraiture of humans, uh, not portraits of famous Alexanders the Great or Pericles or Julius Caesar, no, of common people. Um, and these are the oldest surviving painted portraits. Uh, most of them on wood or, or uh, some of them on linen. It, is an evidence of how long the practice of mummification was continued in ancient Egypt. We spoke about the uh, various forms of cultural entanglement and how that becomes more important for one's identity than um, what we would say uh, identifies a race. This person or the persons that we saw on the other portraits you wouldn't be able to pin them down to a specific country. They are from the Mediterranean. Um, work on workshops or artistic circles. Are we talking about schools? Are there teachers uh, and apprentices? That is just something that we are still trying to figure out. Uh, this is the largest group that has been brought together and I think that the other two uh, Philadelphia workshops are somehow related, uh, maybe a few generations later. Um, but for me, uh, thank you for your attention. Make sure to go upstairs, not only to check out this portrait, but if you haven't been upstairs, there's a fabulous exhibition on Impressionism that you need to see um, because it's fantastic. <laughs>